This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 21, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, the top three issues are these. First, Governor Mike Dunleavy's proposed payback of past PFD cuts and why we oppose. Second, but why we believe preserving future PFDs is critical. And third, a quick primer on a flat tax, what we think is a better alternative going forward than PFD cuts. And now let's join Michael. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, where things are going in the state. And we're going to start off with the latest proposal, which you and I hadn't, we didn't get a chance to talk about last week because it came out after the show that we did. And that is Governor's Dunleavy's proposal to pay back the PFD. Initially, we thought maybe it was going to be in one fell swoop. His new plan, though, instead is to pay it back over three years. What is your analysis on this? Well, Michael, I want to divide this discussion into two pieces. I want to talk about Governor Dunleavy's payback proposal first in the first segment, and then I want to talk about what we do with the PFD going forward uh, in the second segment, because there are okay. really two issues and they have, they have two separate drivers. To understand the payback issue, the first issue, I think we need, we need to step back a little bit and see where we've been in the last seven years. In the last seven years, the Alaska legislature, Alaska government has run $18 billion in deficits. Um, you, I've, got a, I've got a piece up where you can see that by year, uh, but, but we've, we've, we've spent more then we've taken in in revenues over the last seven years by $18 billion. That's a lot of money. But what is even more shocking is when you sort of do it as a percentage, as a percentage of spending, a third of our spending has has been in deficit. Uh, we haven't had revenues to cover a third of our spending. We've pulled from fiscal reserves um, uh, in order, to, in order to, to maintain that spending over the last seven years. That reserve, those fiscal reserves need to be filled back up. Uh, and they're going to be filled back up by future generations. This generation has essentially kicked the can down the road to future generations and say, hey, you know, we consumed all of these fiscal reserves. We know you're going to need them when you run into uh, your own set of economic conditions, but you're going to have to fill them back up. We're not going to give you, we're, we're, we're leaving sort of the, the cupboard bare as we hand off uh, from the from the last seven years uh, uh, to the future, of the eighteen billion dollars, the eighteen billion dollars in deficits, Alaskans current the current generation of Alaskans have been called on really to cover two billion of that, a little over two billion of that, through PFD cuts, which in essence have been a tax. Right. So so instead of the eighteen the total eighteen billion dollars being kicked down the road, eleven percent of that, eleven percent of the deficits have been covered through the PFD tax over, over the last three years uh, and reduced the deficit we're kicking down the road to $16 billion instead of, instead of $18 billion. The problem I have with the, with the payback, the PFD payback that, that Governor Dunleavy has proposed and, and Senator Wilkowski has proposed is, they, is they're essentially proposing to reverse that tax now and, and not even have the current generation of Alaskans cover that 11% uh, of the deficit. They want to kick even that 11% down the road uh, by reducing presumably the earnings reserve account in order to pay back uh, uh, that the, the tax that was assessed over the last three years. Don't get me wrong. 
that tax was wrong. And as we'll talk about in the second segment, I don't believe a PFD tax uh, is the right way uh, to fund government. But that's the way the legislature chose in the last three years to have current the current generation cover at least a portion uh, of the deficits uh, that they were creating. So to, to refund that now, to rebate that tax now, just makes the future problem even worse and frankly, lets this generation get off scot-free. I mean, we're only having to pay 11% of the deficits we've created as it is, but rebating that now just lets the current generation get off scot-free uh, and kicks all of the problem down the road to future generations, and I just think that's wrong. What we're essentially doing, if we would pay that back, is we're essentially reducing the earnings reserve account for future generations. We're reducing future PFDs, uh, for future generations, just to make this generation's life a little bit easier um, and, and rebate uh, that 11 percent we paid. I think this current generation, frankly, I think this current generation should have paid more. If we had paid more, frankly, we probably would have reduced spending because we would have realized how much of a deficit we were running. But I think it's wrong to rebate that 11 percent now uh, and kick even that down the road. I think this current gener generation needs to just live with what uh, the legislature has done to it for the last three years, move on uh, and change the dynamic going forward. You know, and, and, and part of me agrees with some of that reasoning, but at the same time, I look at it and say, the legislature broke the law. I mean, now, granted, they can write the law, so I know that there's semantics in there as to whether or not they can be held accountable, but they've broken the law. I mean, this is this is this was not their money. This was the people's money. And granted, if we had been hit on this earlier and you know snapped in the pocketbook, uh, you know, five years ago, this may not have been an issue at all because the people would have stood up and and put somebody like Dunleavy in to begin with. Um, but the problem is is that uh, you know this is just continues to tear into the economy. One and two. This is the people's money, and this is kind of the argument that you and I have had uh, as we've talked about this payback, is that, you know, while I agree three years, uh, you know, the first two years that that money was taken, it was left in the earnings reserve account, and that was not government's money. That was the people's money. Um, and so if we were going to do a payback, I even acquiesced and said I'd be up for paying the last, the first two years back, but not the third because that money has been taken and spent. Uh, so that would have to be new generation of revenue. But there are monies in that earnings reserve account that do not belong there. Well, I agree that the legislature broke the law. But in essence, what they, I mean, from an economic standpoint, what they did really was just tax the PFD. Now, they didn't. They didn't pay it out, uh, which the law said uh, that they should. But what they really, I mean, the economic effect was they paid it out and then they took it back. Um, they taxed it back and, and, and put it back into, uh, into the reserve. And what they were doing, when you look at the, at, you can't just look at the earnings reserve account, what was going on in the earnings reserve account. You have to look at all of the accounts. And what they were really doing was using that money to offset spending that was going on in the CBR and to keep, um, uh, the earnings reserve account uh, uh, a little bit higher, keep total savings or total or total reserves um, a little bit higher. Yes, they broke the law, but they can't. But the legislature can tax. Nobody argues that the legislature can't tax. Right, right. The legislature can tax. They essentially taxed the PFD in order to cover a portion of the deficit, 11 percent uh, of the deficit. And now to rebate that tax. Uh, and to send it out to uh, send it out to the current generation is essentially saying you can have your cake and eat it too. You can you can run this this eight this eighteen billion dollars in deficits over the last seven years. You can have government uh, that you didn't pay for uh, over the last seven years. You didn't pay a third of the cost of the government you had over the last uh, uh, seven years. You can have all that, and you don't have to pay for it. We'll give you back the money, the little bit of money, the the eleven percent that you paid to go toward that deficit, we'll give you that back too. Uh, and we'll kick that on down the road to future generations. I just, we are, we are piling a huge amount of, of obligations on future generations. We, 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 if you look at PERS and TERS, the way that is, is set up, uh, that's the, the bulk of it's really gonna come due on the watch of future generations. If you look at what the legislature did with HB 331, uh, they kicked the, the cost of, of the refundable oil tax credits down the road to future generations. And now we're talking about, you know, rebating 
Uh, this 11% that we covered of the deficit, we're talking about rebating that to future generations. Th this generation needs to stand up and take some responsibility. I mean, I know people like to say, oh, it was the legislature that did it. It wasn't, it wasn't the people. Well, the people elected the legislature. Right. We, this, this generation needs to stand up and take some responsibility for what happened. Brad Keithley is our guest from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets here on The Michael Duke Show. Uh, Brad, that, I mean, that's a hard lesson uh, to learn. I mean, this is one of the reasons why when the dividend was, uh, was created, uh, one of the things that Hammond said that needed to continue uh, was the income tax in the state of Alaska simply because it would show people, it would give them that skin in the game so they would understand that there was a cost to their government. Um, and I know that's not popular, but I understand the I understand the reasoning behind it because he's right in the regard of people were disconnected from what their government costs. Oh yeah, we want astroturf fields. Oh yeah, we want uh, more of this. Oh yeah, we want more of these big state buildings. We want more of that. Um, never understanding what the actual cost was because they would never see it hit their bottom line uh, until it was too late. Quite honestly. Yeah, and now we've seen it, and now we've seen it with the PFD tax, and we're making changes. I mean, we elected Governor Dunleavy instead of, instead of retaining Governor Walker. Uh, we're now going to go through a process in the budget where we're going to face up to some significant budget cuts. I mean, we're not going to get to $1.6 billion, but we're going to make some budget cuts. Now that we've seen it with the PFD tax, uh, we're, we're making some, some changes. The problem is if you rebate that, if you, if you say, oh, never mind, uh, yeah, we know we made you pay 11%, but now you get all that back, then you're going to start taking the pressure off again uh, to make these changes. Alaskans need to face up to the fact that they got free government off the backs of future generations uh, to the tune of about $18 billion uh, over the last seven years. They need to pay, the current generation needs to pay some of that. We can't, we can't kick it all, we shouldn't kick it all down the road uh, to future generations. Uh, Brad Keithley, uh, we're coming to the end of the segment here. Brad, you want to wrap up number one here um, and so that we can move on to the break and then come back for number two? Yep. You got it. We, we've got to divide the PFD issue into two pieces. One, the payback of the last three years, and two, what we do about the PFD going forward. Uh, when, you look at the, when you look at the payback issue, uh, you can't just say, oh, that was wrong. You've got to look at the economic effect of it. The economic effect was to have the current generation pay a portion uh, of the deficits. It was it's racked up the last seven years, um, and 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 you know, too bad that we racked up the deficits. But the current generation did it. The legislatures, the current generation did it, and the current generation needs to pay at least a portion of it. That's what PFD taxes were. They shouldn't be rebated back. Uh, we, we, the, the current generation shouldn't get off scot free from paying anything toward uh, the deficit. I mean, the more I look at these numbers, Brad, uh, the more discouraged I get because I realize that what we're about to do is uh, slap a, uh, you know, slap a one inch kid band aid on a gushing arterial wound at this point. Because it, I mean, it literally is, I think, in, in a lot of ways, too little, too late because we've gone too far down this road. Um, we might be able to pull back on enough of the spending, um, but I mean, it would quite honestly, it would gut out uh, several whole departments inside the state of Alaska to get to the point to where we would be sustainable without really needing some form of alternative revenue and still be able to pay a full PFD for the long term. Yeah, what we should have done, Michael, is what is what Scott Goldsmith was recommending back in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 14, 15 was look at how much we could afford to spend based upon our current revenue and fit spending inside of that. Uh, if we had, for example, I think we would have woken up to the fact we couldn't afford three universities that we needed to consolidate down to one university. We shouldn't be spending on AstroTurf football fields. Uh, we shouldn't be building on new, we shouldn't be building new high school, high school football stadiums at every uh, high school in Anchorage, the old ACS, uh, uh, AFS, uh, Anch Anchorage football stadium was enough. We should have maybe refurbished it. Uh, there's a lot of things we, we would have done differently if we'd looked at that cap. The problem is uh, that we had all of those reserves and and both constituents and legislators said, oh, we'll wait till next year to do all that stuff. We'll just keep spending for now. And we've run it, we've racked up this $18 billion in deficits. Um, and now we've still got three universities and we've got all those, we've got all those high schools and buildings that need to be maintained. We've, we've got two engineering buildings, one at UAF and one at UAA. 
Uh, we've got all these nice things that, that have to be maintained, and we've built up, frankly, a population and a state workforce that matches that. Uh, people have become accustomed to it uh, and don't want to don't want to cut back. And that's I mean, that's the reality we face. If we would have started this in 2012 when Scott was was telling us how much we could afford to spend, we'd be in a different place right now. But we didn't. We racked up that 18 billion dollars in deficits. And now we've got a, and now we've just got we're in a different place as a state and we got to deal with that. <laughs> Rick in the chat room says, Brad, you keep saying we Kimo Sabi. I didn't vote for any of this. Um, and, and while I definitely feel Rick's pain on that comment, the problem is, is that y- you're right. I didn't vote for it. Rick didn't vote for it. Probably Brad didn't vote for it. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the state was just get along to, you know, go along to get along. Um, they're like, okay, it's all good. I mean, this in hindsight, and I don't like taxes more than anybody else. And I was happy, you know, like anybody else to see the, uh, income tax go away, but now I understand how it was a bellwether. It was a canary in the coal mine, and we took the canary outside and let it free um, so that you had no idea what was going on down in the depths of Juneau. Um, of course, you know, being separate and away and everything else, we just we have no idea. Uh, and this goes back to my previous snarky comment about being told to sit down and shut up and let them govern. Um, because that's what they want to do. And, and the nature of government is to grow. That is just the nature. It doesn't make people evil, but it is the nature. And if we're not watching uh, because we're not invested in the process, it's, it's going to grow faster. And that's, what, that's what's happened. And now we're, we're in trouble. I mean, we're in real trouble. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we may not have voted for these people, but – but as, as Bill Topol is, is, is very good at pointing out to me, we have a republic and, you know, we vote for people and, and we send them down there and govern and they get to decide by majority rule what it is it happens to our government. And we're we are the governed. We are we are subject to that. Um, and and, you know, people may not have voted for this stuff, but I have friends who said, oh, yeah, we need to astroturf that football field. Johnny needs my kid needs a football field as good as there is any in Texas because he's a great football player. And by gosh, you know, he could make the pros if he just has the right field. And, you know, and my friends said, oh, God, we don't you know, we need limited government and we need limited spending. And you're damn you're right about it you know, cutting back on that spending, but my Johnny needs that football field. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, we may not have voted for these people, but, but collectively as a community, we kept pressing them to, to give us more good things, to, to give us more, uh, uh, more government, more spending, more jobs, more construction jobs, give us, give us a, a, an engineering building at UAA and UAF, give us a new health sciences building, give us, you know, AstroTurf football fields. Give us a new UAA athletic arena. Give us, give us, give us. And and that's and 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 government did. They went down there every year and they said, "By gosh, our constituents want this." And you know, and look at this fiscal reserve over here. We can keep yep. dipping into. And we're and look at where and look at where it's got us because we just ceased paying attention. And not all of us, but most of us just ceased paying attention. Continuing now with Brad Keith Lee from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three, although I feel like we're only going to get to two of the three today. Maybe we'll sneak the third one in at the very, very end. Uh, Brad, we were just talking about the payback on the PFD, and that actually naturally falls into the uh, into the next one, your number two, which is preserving the PFD is going to be critical not just for Alaskans themselves, but also to continue to help fund the services and government that we have right now. Yeah, so let's let's talk about let's talk about this point forward. Let's forget about the payback of past PFDs now. Let's talk about this point forward. And this point forward, you continue to see red ink when you do that when you do the ten year pro- off off of traditional revenues. When you do the ten year uh, projections off of traditional revenues, and you look at sort of status quo spending. Uh, adjusted for inflation, not even population uh, growth, uh, if we have any, but 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 just sort of status quo spending, you see red ink that for the next 10 years that averages out $2.7 billion per year uh, for the next seven years. Rev- spending outstrips revenues uh, by that, that amount. It moves from a third, the deficit moves from a third of spending to more than more than half. Uh, of spending over the next 10 years. Now, some of that 
is offset by doing Hammond 50-50, taking a portion of the uh, earnings, re, uh, the, the income coming off the, the permanent fund, the earnings off the permanent fund, and splitting a portion of that to government as well as maintaining the PFD. But even that, uh, uh, after that adjustment, you still have deficits uh, that are around the billion dollar mark uh, per year uh, going forward uh, into the future. That's still 20%. Uh, of spending over the over the next ten years, so we've got we've got a gap, and and the difference between going forward and looking back is we don't have fiscal reserves, we don't have the kitty banks uh, that we hear the the piggy banks that we can go break uh, and uh, and continue continue this spending spree. We've done we've gone through all those. So when you look going forward, we've got to come up with with uh, some new revenue sources. Some people talk about. Um, uh, 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 oil taxes, well, oil taxes, you, you and I have talked on the show about some adjustments to oil taxes. Oil taxes may pay a part of that. But even if you increase the current oil tax revenues by 25%, you're only talking about $200 million. You're not getting at the billion-dollar uh, deficits that uh, – you're not knocking down the billion-dollar deficits that we've got. So there's a, there's a gap that, that is showing up over the next 10 years that we're going to have to deal with. The question is how we deal with it. The, the Senate, the Alaska Senate, has said continually they want to deal with it through PFD cuts. They right. want to continue to make cuts uh, in order to cover, cover those spending deficits. Um, and they continue to say that uh, even now uh, uh, in, the, in the current legislature. In fact, there's, <laughs> there was an article in the, in the Anchorage Daily News that said, hey, we can cover that deficit. All we have to do is take the PFD down to $400. Yep. Take it from three thousand dollars down to four hundred dollars. Deficit's gone. Don't worry about it. The problem is PFD cuts. Icer told us three years ago, four years ago now, three years ago now, Icer told us PFD cuts, which essentially are PFD taxes, have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. Are by far the costliest option to Alaska families and increase poverty levels uh, in the state. PFD cuts are the worst way possible. In, from an economic standpoint, uh, to cover the deficit, and so there, there are a lot. There are other ways to do it, and and we'll talk about that either in the third segment or we'll talk about it in future, future segments. There are other ways to do it, but PFD cuts are the worst possible way to do it. But it is the way that the at least the Alaska Senate has continually said they want to go to. There's a reason for that. PFD cuts have the have the lowest impact on the top 20 percent uh, by income of, of Alaska givers. It is less than uh, looking at the uh, 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 the um, the impact on the top 20 percent of, of of a PFD cut. It's less than two percent of their income uh, on the top 20 percent. If you go to the top 10 percent, it's less than one percent uh, of their uh, uh, of their income uh, come from PFD cuts. So what the top 20% is doing is say, yeah, do PFD cuts. Boy, you know, we barely feel them. The problem is PFD cuts hit the middle and lower income classes uh, the hardest, and that's why they have, frankly, such a huge impact on the economy. They have such a huge impact on families because you're talking about the remaining 80% of Alaskans, right? Right. PFD, P, PFD cuts hit them harder than any of the alternatives. So that's why you have the impact of them. If we don't have this discussion, if we don't realize these issues and talk about them during this session, we're going to get to the end of the session, and the Alaska Senate is going to go, is going to say again, well, easiest thing to do is PFD cuts. Let's do PFD cuts. Uh, Anchorage Daily News says if we take it down to $400, we cover the deficit. Done. Zero. Let's do that and, and go forward. People, if they want to protect the PFD, and they should because of the adverse economic impact, they need to, we need to be standing up and talking about the need to protect the PFD. That ne necessarily means, given the deficits we're running, that necessarily means we have to talk affirmatively about alternatives. Um, and just saying, oh, cut the budget, uh, that'll take care of it. It's not going to take care of it. Raise oil taxes, that'll take care of it. It's not going to take care of it. Alaskans are going to have to pay for part of their spending. The question is how we do it. The Senate wants to do it through PFD cuts. There are better ways. We need to be talking about those better ways. Because I think one of the things, Brad Keithley, by the way, is our guest from Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Um, one of the hard truths here is that if we cut the $1.6 billion out of the government, 
we are going to cut some we're going to cut some uh, some departments some, some some services i think it could be found it would be pretty much down to the bone at that point because we could look back at that spending level and see that it would equal what it was almost 15 years ago before we got into this oil glut and and they started overspending i mean it would be it would be pretty down and dirty um and i think it's leaving the only option on the table at this point is that they have to find some other form of revenue. And I'll be honest with you, I'm reading exactly uh, the same thing between the lines that you are, which is the senators are all about cutting the PFD. They've got no problem. They were not up for re-election this year. A lot of them were not up for re-election this year. And those that weren't failed to learn the lessons of those that were and got booted out. Uh, because they're like all about it. They're, I've seen all these comments from Von Imhoff and Stedman and others that have basically said, yeah, I'm all about it. We're just going to take that. The money's right there. We'll just take it. Um, and so it is going to happen uh, unless we offer some kind of viable alternative uh, that uh, is more palatable to everyone across the state and makes more sense in the long run. And, uh, I mean, you've got the option for that. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I mean, the senator, when you look, it, there, there's it, there's a combination of things going on in the Senate. When you look at their personal incomes, by and large, almost to almost without exception, uh, uh, senators are in the top 20 percent. Hell, the, the state, the, the state legislative salary alone almost moves them to the top 20 percent. If they've got any sort of private income, that kicks them on up to the 20, top 20 percent. So their personal their personal position, the lens through which they look at things, is, hey, PFD cuts are good because it takes less out of our pocket uh, than than any of the alternatives, and and you know we can make up a, a, an argument that it's fair. Um, plus, if you look at their support system, their contributors, the 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 crowd they run in, the lobbyists that are down in Juno. This is one of the places the Juno bubble works against us. Uh, the lobbyists go down there; they're going down there for people all largely in the top 20%. Right. And and those people are saying, you know, when you go back and look at Ron Duncan, GCI's original campaign uh, to cut the PFD, it was Ron Duncan's in the top 20%. The guy's no fool. He knows uh, 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 what, you know, what was going to hurt him the less, the, the least. So it, this is a, this is a mammoth push by the top 20%, uh, both the senators personally and their support system, um, uh, to, to, to push the, the cost of government off on the remaining 80% of Alaskans. There are be- – and, and doing it, they don't care that it has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. They don't care that it is by far the costliest option for Alaska families. They don't care that it increases poverty levels. It just does them and their support system uh, uh, the best. Right. Um, <clears throat> We're down to less than two minutes here, Brad. Um uh, I agree uh, with everything that you're saying. And, and in fact, when you look at the salaries of the entire legislature and see that the vast, vast majority of them are in the upper 20 percent, uh, something like 85 percent of them are in the top, you know, 15 uh, percent. You could see why the PFD has been such a juicy target. Let's sum up here, Brad. you got about uh, 90 seconds here. Well, there there is a better there. There are better ways to do this going forward. We're going to have we're going to have budget gaps. We don't have the fiscal reserves that we've had the last seven years to enable us to float by. The budget gaps are huge, uh, even after uh, uh, doing Hammond 50-50, even after taking a portion of the permanent fund earnings stream uh, and giving it to, to government. The, the budget deficits are still over a billion dollars. Huge. Uh, we've got we've got a, a gap that's going to have to be filled. Can't cut our way out of it. Oil taxes aren't – modified oil taxes aren't going to get our way out of it. Alaskans are going to have to pay something. And and the people listening to this program and elsewhere need to fa- need to face up to the fact the Senate and others are going to try to push it to PFD cuts, uh, and it's going to take a very strong effort uh, pushing an alternative. And there are better alternatives pushing an alternative to get, uh, to get to the legislature to do something different uh, than PFD cuts to, to close this gap. But we need to do it. Because yep. PFD can have the largest adverse impact. You bet. Uh, and number three, of course, is that alternative, the flat tax. And again, we could fill like two hours with this discussion, uh, Brad. Uh, the alternative is really the only viable, long-term, um, equitable alternative is the flat tax. Um, and I know that 
you and I have both taken some heat for even bringing it up. I mean, it was pure heresy the first time we talked about it. I remember the screaming and yelling and gnashing of teeth that we heard the first time we brought this up on the program that we at least needed to talk about it simply as a kind of proactive stopgap defensive measure. Um, but, it, I mean, it's come down to it now to where it's not even really defensive. We have got to talk about something because they are going to go find the revenue somewhere. And the low-hanging fruit for them, as you've pointed out for the last 40 minutes, is the PFD. We have got to offer a viable alternative, and we've got to push it through. But, I mean, I, I think that they will fight tooth and nail against that. What, what are your thoughts? Well, the flat tax is is fair, and and I think a brief primer is important for people. Um, I'll do it now, and we can and we'll pick it up in other shows. But but basically, a flat tax says everybody has income, even even the lowest income Alaskans have have income, and a flat tax says we're going to take the same percentage uh, of income uh, across the board from all Alaskans, from high income Alaskans as well as from low income Alaskans. Um, and and if, so everybody's going to have to contribute. Everybody's going to have skin in the game. But because we spread it so broadly, uh, because the divisor is such a huge uh, amount of income, the tax itself has to be re- can be relatively low uh, in order to raise the income. So if we want to raise $750 million, which is usually what these PFD proposals are, cut the PFD to raise $750 million. If we want to raise $750 million, the flat tax uh, across the board would be 2.65%. So a family uh, in the top 20% that has a, an adjusted gross income of $250,000 would pay 2.5%. That's about uh, $6,000 uh, on that family. A family in the lowest uh, 20% that has an adjusted gross income of about $16,000 would pay 2.65%. That's only $400 to that family. But everybody would be treated fairly. The problem with the problem with the proposals other proposals have out there is they're just trying to shove it on somebody else. The PFD cut the PFD is the top 20 percent trying to shove it on the lowest on the remaining 80 percent. Progressive income tax is just like is the is the is the bottom 50 percent trying to shove the cost on the on the top 50 percent. Those people who say let's 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 do this through oil taxes are just trying to shove the problem over on on the oil companies. Everybody. All Alaskans need to participate in this. All Alaskans need to have an incentive to look at lowering spending. All Alaskans need to contribute to the deficits that we're creating. Uh, and I, and in my view, the flat tax is the most efficient, economically justifiable, results in the lowest rate, um, and creates the greatest incentives to cut spending going forward. Uh, I think Don sums up. I think Don and we just I've got another call on hold here. We're going to take as we come out of the top of the break. So hold on the line caller there. But, Brad, uh, I think Don kind of sums up the um, the feeling that a lot of Alaskans going to have. He says, damn, Brad, we pay every day just to live in Alaska. I'm tired of being told we have to pay to live here. The costs are real Add a tax and a majority of population is going to leave. He said, I would lay money on that. And I would agree that if you increase, uh, you know, you start taxing people, uh, you know, a significant amount, there's going to be a portion of the population that is going to leave, which, of course, has that, you know, reverse biofeedback loop kind of thing where now you have a smaller portion of the population that you have to spread that tax burden to, which in turn forces more to leave, which in turn causes it to increase. You know what I mean? It yep. really it, it makes it a very difficult situation. What I mean, what's your answer to that? My answer to that is we're already taxed, Michael. The PFD cut is a tax. The tax on on the on on the the high the upper middle income class, the sixty to eighty percent bracket from a PFD cut tax on a family of four is four point nine three percent, nearly five percent. A flat tax would drop that to two point six five percent. The PFD tax on a on a middle income family, the forty to sixty percent income bracket family of four uh, under a PFD cut is eight point two four percent. A flat tax would be 2.65%. The tax on the on the lower middle income family, 20 to 40% income bracket from a PFD cut is 14.62%. A flat tax would be 2.65%. It, it is not a situation where we're talking about no tax or tax. We have a tax. We're being PFD taxed, cuts. right? Yeah. And we're going to continue to have that tax unless we unless we come up with an alternative. My suggestion is the alternative it, it's slightly higher for the top 20%. Uh, they're trying to get off scot-free, frankly, under PFD cuts. It's slightly 
higher for the top 20%, but a flat tax is lower than the PFD tax for the remaining 80%. Yeah, well, and and that's kind of the, the, the true reality is we are being taxed right now, but is it equitable? And the answer to that is no. They're affecting the lower 80% a lot more than that top 20%, of which, again, I'll point out that the legislature is made up predominantly of people, and I want to say it's something like 65% are in the top 10% of income earners in the state. So, I mean, you've got a significant amount of people down there who it's in their self-interest to not have a flat tax or anything like that. They would much rather see it come in the form of the free money of PFDs taxing that money instead. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him on Facebook. The link is at the top of the page right there if you're watching online right now. Uh, or you can just Google Alaskans for Sustainable Budget and you will find uh, Brad and his writings each and every day. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and uh, talking with us. Um, I have a feeling we're going to have to dive down into this flat tax for like a whole show one day instead of a top three we're going to have to deal with just the flat tax and kind of answer these questions so i I look forward to it thank you brad for coming on board and joining us today brad keithley alaskans for sustainable budget well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube and soundcloud pages and keep track of us during the week on facebook and twitter This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.